Thanks, everybody. Ken Chenault, Larry Fink. Um, you know, when we were thinking about today and trying to think about the economy and how do you actually cover it all? How do you touch the consumer? Uh, how do you touch the markets? How do you touch the global economy? Um, it really was sort of a, a fantastic opportunity to put both of these people uh, together. And then to also think about the relationship between uh, the CEO of a business and the investor of a business. And when we think I'm about- I'm a CEO too, though. You are a yeah. CEO too, Larry Fink, I know. <laughs> But to think about the, this dynamic, and we talk about playing for the long term, you have played for a very long term, and we're thrilled to have you here, I should say, uh, just several weeks ago now, right. announcing uh, your retirement from American Express. Right. Uh, you've been here before, Larry has been here before as well, and we're thrilled uh, to have both of you. Um, let me just, just table stakes, just so everybody understands where we are, and then I wanna get into uh, what it means to be a CEO in this environment, and what it means to be an investor and a CEO in this environment. Um, but table stakes on the economy. Um, we talk a lot about, we see what, where the stock market is going, um, but people also talk about the real economy. You have a remarkable pulse on where the consumer is. You, you see it all. Where are we? I would say I think overall uh, the consumer is mm -hmm. in pretty good shape, but I think as we all understand, we're not talking about a robust economy. But what is interesting, if you look around the world, the economy has been relatively stable uh, in a range of markets. I don't think that's happened for quite a while. And if you'd asked me a year ago, how would you feel? I would have told you I've got concerns in this region, in this region. And we're at a point in time where, in fact, things are holding up pretty well. That said, what you're seeing is a demarcation in performance because there are some companies, in fact, many companies, that have not been able to take advantage of the stability. And in fact, we're banking on seeing an improvement in the economy. And so the consumer is, they're certainly spending. We're certainly seeing that on our cards. Uh, they certainly want experiences. They like to travel. Uh, and we're seeing from a millennial perspective a strong interest both in our products and services, but also experiences and travel. Good holiday season coming? I'm not going to predict what the holiday season is going to be, but what I would say is that um, the last few quarters for us, we've been very encouraged about the spending. Larry, we've talked about this a lot. And over, over the past year, it feels like your view has shifted. Uh, we talked about how unclear uh, and, frankly, inst unstable perhaps the world was. People didn't know where, we, where things were headed. Um, but where are we now, and, 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 and who are you going to give credit to for it? To you, Andrew. No. <laughs> um, the world economy is more synchronized in positive growth than we've seen in 12 years. As, as Ken said, I'm very surprised at this. Um, a year and a half ago, we were worried about China. China deliberately increased debt to reboot the economy. The economy is growing in high sixes. The euphoria outs after the uh, party congress, I, it feels like it's going to grow seven plus. Huge amount of consumerism that's the delta in record of, and big increase in exports. Japan is probably one of the great surprises, 30 years of no growth and <clears throat> growing at 2.5%. And then you have Europe, and that's a big surprise. A year ago, I would have said, I'm, I'm very worried about the Eurozone stability. And uh, the Europeans all voted for centrism, essentially, and you have Macron now, who in five months has, has transformed the French economy. France may become one of the, uh, again, a leader in the entire Euro debate again, uh, you unquestionably the Chancellor in Germany has more instability in her formation of her coalition. But you have a very aggressive central bank. You have um, strong banking uh, union now, and so you have a Europe growing at two and a half percent. And and then the other surprise is how robust the U.S. economy is, how strong corporate profits are. I would say that, that's my biggest surprise, how robust corporate profitability is. Um, even with a 
quite dysfunctional Washington. And you put this all together, um, we have a very strong global economy. I must say, though, prices are more extreme now. So much of corporate profitability is validating the, the stock market valuations, but we have risen three plus multiple points. Um, so, you know, we're not, we're not extreme prices, but we're certainly not cheap. Okay, let me ask you a, a semi-political question. This is Donald Trump earlier this week on Twitter. The reason our stock market is so successful is because of me. Uh, Greg Ipp in today's paper says, Mr. Trump should be giving thanks, not taking credit. Who's right? Well, I don't want to. I think that China is right, Japan is right, Europe is right, the private sector of America is right, and the president has given more confidence in some business through the, some deregulation that's allowed, you know, you're seeing more spending by some companies. And so I would say uh, there are many parts of the world that have created this atmosphere. And I would say the United States is partly contributing to this. Okay. Um, here's where I want to go with this conversation. As I said <clears throat> earlier, this idea of you, you being, both of you a CEO, but you being a CEO of a company that I think you have funds invested in. I want to, I want to, and, and when we think mm -hmm. about the theme of today, this idea of playing for the long term, this big conversation about activism and short termism. And I, I want to just start here, Ken. Uh, over your career at American Express, there were a number of what I would call major challenges, 9-11 uh, being one, the, probably the biggest, um, the 2008 financial crisis being another, and then some pretty um, controversial decisions that you made in the past several years around uh, undoing or, or not renewing deals with Costco, JetBlue, Absolutely. and the like. And let me just read to you what some of uh, the shareholders were saying at the time. They said, I think you have a CEO who has overstayed his welcome at the time. They said, for Chenault, this may be a moment to reflect on whether he can be most helpful to Amex's other shareholders by sticking around and fighting or making a graceful exit. This is what they were right. saying, and the stock was down. Right. And you had the barbarians at the gate. Absolutely. <laughs> and I think you can fairly say today you've won. But I want to understand, as a CEO with that pressure, not I'm not looking at you for that pressure, but from the we investment part community, of that pressure, right? what that was like and how you dealt with it and how you think other CEOs in this audience should, should, should deal with it. So here I think... What I think is very important, Andrew, is you know one of my leadership sayings is the role of a leader is to find reality and give hope. And certainly there have been periods where it's been real tough to define reality and give hope. But I've always managed the company for the moderate to long term. Even in the financial crisis, the mantra that I had for the company was stay liquid, stay profitable, and selectively invest in growth. And people said, how can you say in the midst of a financial crisis, you're going to invest in growth. Because I said, we have opportunities for growth. We're going to emerge stronger. But I also think what's important, and Costco is actually is a great example, is I think short-termism has really devolved into a situation where short-term is two weeks, long-term is two years for some people. And the reality is, if you really say, I'm going to embark on a long-term strategy over five to 10 years. The question is, what are the metrics and signposts that you're putting in place? Because appropriately, people are not going to sit back and say, all right, I trust you. It's going to take time. But the Costco decision was a very important one because I said to our board and I said to our leadership team and our employees is, look, as I think about the future of the next 10 years of retail, there is a major transformation going on. Online and digital is taking over. So are we going to make a bid at top of the market for an asset that I don't think, frankly, is going to dramatically appreciate in value? But I also said, we are going to get hammered. I didn't fully um, expect to be hammered as much as we were. But I think what was critical is we had the willingness to make the tough decision. We put together an investment plan that was covering just two years. 
And in two years, we came back and our stock is at all time highs. But what I am not at all naive about, if I did not have Warren Buffett and other investors like Larry who were focused on the moderate to long term, the barbarians were at the gates. And some activists who were short term in orientation would have said, we're going to jump on this immediately. Because look at the situation. Because people were questioning, what happened to the business model? Well, what happened to the business model is we decided, in fact, to reset. And that we had a range of growth opportunities that now position the company incredibly well, not just now, but for the next several years. But that was a tough call. And fortunately, we had the support <coughs> to get through two years, not five years. So when people say to me, Ken, you had the courage to make a long-term decision, I said, that's 24 months. So I think this mm -hmm. dynamic has changed in the definition of what is long-term. Right. But Larry, let me ask you a different question. You do talk about the long-term all the time. But what is the role of the market to be a check on that decision, right? Well, I would argue that the tension that Ken felt was probably a good one. Um, he made a a judgment call that his long-term shareholders are going to be supportive of the positions that he made. There is a role for short-term uh, uh, active investors, and I think that's the tension and dynamics of the markets that make it make it so efficient work. So, I, I'm not, I, I you know, I don't want to address the singularity of what Ken and American Express did, but. Let's be clear, the market dynamics are good. We're, testing, we're being tested as management teams and boards, making sure we're doing the right thing. I do believe we have lost focus and there is too much short-termism, but I think it's gonna be hard, you know, as Ken suggested, short-term is only two, uh, long-term is only two years, and I think that's the eco, ecosystem we're all working in. I mean, I, I, I would say long-term for Washington is about six weeks, so, we're living in a world where everything has been truncated to, to smaller components of time. And it's hard to have long-term strategies for so many companies, but the issue we have at large, and this is the dominant theme that's gonna be carrying out the investment markets, because of the rule changes, with, uh, whether it's the fiduciary rule or the MIFID II in Europe, we estimate another two to five trillion dollars of money and equities are gonna to move to passive. The issue around passive, and this is my epiphany when I first started writing the letters are, we're the ultimate long-term holder. We have to own all the companies that are in an index. So we own some really bad companies and really good companies. If you're an active manager, you don't like a company, you could sell it. Or you could be an activist, but generally most just sell. I can't sell. I have only one power, and I'm going to use that power heavily, and that's the power of the vote. But you've become much more active, we should say. We have in terms of, no, no, in terms of supporting. It used to be that the quote unquote passive investor, and I don't know if you like the passive investor historically, but that, no. the, that the passive investor was, was going to vote with management. There are now a series of, of, of times, in recent times, I think you, you voted against ADP and for Bill Ackman uh, very recently. So the big funds are now changing a little bit of their stripes in terms of how, how, whatever, how you're approaching that. As right? I said, our only power is the power of the vote. Uh, in the last few years, 70% of the time, we have voted with management, 30% against management. What we are asking management, and we had conversations with Ken and supported Ken, we asked management to be involved with us through the year. Express us, tell us your long-term strategy. And if we know your long-term strategy and we believe your long-term strategy, we will most, most of the time, if not all the time, vote with management. So I, I actually believe what we, are, what we are evolving to is a, is a um, business proposition where we are going to be much more active but not and as an activist. We want to be engaged in working with our large companies where we are investing, you know, five, six percent of their equity valuation. Um, 
and I believe we could play a very long-term systematically positive role. But let's be clear, as I said, we own an index. There are a lot of poorly run companies in the index. And there are a lot of really good companies in the index. So can but, you know, here's the, I was just going to say, so he manages now almost, are we over six trillion yet? With a T, yeah. six trillion dollars. Right. Do you prefer having passive investors or active investors, individual yeah. investors? In I don't think it's an either or. Yeah. Uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, to Larry's point, uh, we actually had dialogue yeah. about our strategy, and he made a, ju a judgment. Yeah, the team uh, did, yeah. And I think that's, that's appropriate. Uh, and I don't have a problem with active investors, but I do think one of the major challenges that we have as a society, not just in the economy, is, and I would say this to new CEOs, is you have to have a mindset to manage in the moderate to long term but in fact, you need to deliver in the short term following your moderate to long-term strategy. And that is a tough balance. But Ken, that's, what that's my, critical. And that's exactly what my letter suggests. If you, if you, if you describe your long-term strategy in your corporate letter, and if we all know the economy changes, the, the, the ecosystem changes, we're, we all have to pivot. Right. Okay, let's be clear. A long-term strategy is not set in stone. It is a guideline. Absolutely. Okay? And... If we understand a long-term strategy of American Expresses and we know there's a change and, and American Express needs to pivot to reach that long-term strategy, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's that, and having that constant dialogue, we could be the greatest supporter. What we see though, some companies, you know, pivot every quarter back and forth and it's, you see the weakness of a board over a management team and that's, that's obviously, those are the underperforming companies. Let me ask you both a question though. Do you think that passive investing has perverted the market? Which is to say, if you talk to people like Seth Klarman, mm -hmm. uh, one of the great value investors, uh, somebody who uh, Warren Buffett um, says he respects and he respects few. I respect them. Hedge, hedge fund managers. And he says, look, all the money, is going into the biggest names. It's creating uh, sort of outsized returns, if you will, on certain places. Uh, but that, it, but that it does. It, it, but that the market is no longer actually functioning uh, the, the way it normally should. So, so let me go first, and then have Larry, because this really impacts him. But my view, frankly, is as CEO, I got to focus on what I can control. I can't control where the funds flow. No. What I can control is the decisions I make in the short, moderate, and long term to drive the business. And in fact, to attract those investors. In our case, I feel very fortunate about the mix of investors, and I feel very fortunate that we have Warren Buffett uh, as an investor. And anyone who knows Warren Buffett, at the end of the day, he is a very nice person, but you gotta deliver. Uh, and he's very did focused. You ever, did he ever call you during all this and, and, and question whether this was No, right? he was very supportive. I went out and explained to him, here is our strategy, which Warren understands, and I talked to him frequently. Uh, and he said, I think this makes tremendous sense. Uh, and Warren knows me well enough that when I decide on a course of action, it's not out of arrogance, it's not that I'm gonna be inflexible, I'll pivot if necessary, but this is one where, this was not a question where he said, my gosh, uh, I think you're making a mistake. In fact, he said, you've got a range of growth opportunities and the term that we talk about is not just the allocation of dollars, but the mind share <clears throat> would have taken of the organization to focus on an opportunity that frankly didn't represent significant growth for the future. So, both of you guys seem, you're, you guys are friends, and I know you guys agree on most things, but there is something you disagree on. Yes. Bitcoin. Oh. <laughs> I want, what, 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 well, you First tell all, me. You tell us the well, things you disagree on. Let's be on. clear. I don't spend any time thinking about Bitcoin. <laughs> I was asked a question about Bitcoin, and I responded, but I don't have a strong opinion on Bitcoin. I heard you say you thought it was a. I said it was a, I believe it is an index for money laundering. <laughs> okay. So, so my view. Ken's in the payment business. But I, so, but I could sit, look at it. I, I, let me just finish. I do believe there's a great need for uh, distributive ledgers 
and I do believe there's a great need for private blockchains and all that. So I understand the technology. We're spending a lot of time on it. You, I was, if you're asking me the question about that specific one blockchain, that's what I think it is. I'm sorry, Ken. So my view is that uh, certainly blockchain we're very focused on, and Bitcoin, as I've said to you before, Andrew, I think is an alternative. But one of the things we've got to recognize is the payments marketplace is a $125 trillion marketplace. Right. This is not a winner-take-all situation. So when people say, are you afraid of Bitcoin, my view in general of technology is you embrace change. Uh, and the comparison that I use, if I go back to the early days of our company, American Express came out with a very novel product, traveler's checks, mm -hmm. which was a replacement for cash. Bitcoin is a replacement for cash. We'll, we'll, we're involved with it. We've actually invested in a company that's involved in Bitcoin. We'll see what happens, uh, but it's not an either or situation. However, the technology, the platform, <laughs> the protocols, yes. I think will have a major impact. I agree with that. Okay, different topic. We're gonna be hearing from Mickey Drexler in a little bit this afternoon on retail. And I would, would love to hear from you about the state of retail and what you think is gonna happen given you see the spends. But I also wanna understand, normally the Seth Klarmans of the world would be buying up retail companies right now because they would, be, they would appear to be cheap. But the question is, are they really? Or, or, or are we in kind, some kind of seismic true shift? So I, I have a great deal of respect for Mickey uh, because of what he was able to create in retail. What I also fundamentally believe is that there are several trends that are dramatically changing retail, and I felt this for a long time. One is the convergence of online offline, which is major. Second is the convergence of payments and commerce. And third is explosion of data. Mm -hmm. uh, and those impacts are substantial. And I go back, people forget, when Steve Jobs came out with Apple stores, he was criticized that it was a, fan, that it was a vanity play, that it was a franchise enhancer, he wasn't gonna make money. And what's important about the convergence of online, offline, which I think retailers in general need to focus on more, is how to change the experience physically. Online is gonna continue to grow substantially. But what Apple Stores has demonstrated is the retail physical experience can be enhanced as a result of digital. And so what you can't do is simply say, I'm gonna have offline over here and online over here. And Best Buy, I would say, is another example of a legacy institution recognizing how they can use their assets to in fact advance. But retail, I think, needs to understand where the puck is going. And I don't think there was enough focus on the convergence of online offline. And I don't think there was enough focus on the explosion of data and analytics. Did the Fink family put money in retail? I was born in retail. Uh, probably not. I'm not in, the way, not in traditional retail. No, I wouldn't. Um, we have to understand that uh, digitally the convenience is enormous. Um, I think people with, um, generally most families have two workers in the family. Time is the most difficult asset that people could navigate. The convenience on digital is only becoming more and more important. Uh, and then two, uh, because of the ability to offer, you know, sizable discounts versus uh, traditional retail because you don't have the brick and mortar. Um, you know, we're, we're hearing more and more negative about what digital's doing. And, but the, the reason why digital is winning, it's winning because it's cheaper and it's more convenient. And so, you know, we're almost now changing the narrative in America about consumerism. The whole foundation of America was about consumerism. Uh, and now we're saying maybe consumerism's gone too far because it's digital. I want to open up to... You know, you know what, I would just say one thing is what I believe fundamentally, 
and I would say that I spent a lot of time out in the Silicon Valley. And the thing I would focus on going forward is when you talk to people in digital companies, they're investing a lot in experiences. Correct. Both online experiences and physical experiences. And that goes back to the convergence of online, offline. Yes. So what is very, very important is don't take a linear view that everything is going to go digital. Because if you examine what millennials want to do, they're focused on experiences, but they're going to use different channels. They're going to use digital to get them access to those experiences. And what we found, for example, with Platinum, is our Centurion lounges. That's physical. People thought we were wasting our money. They are doing incredibly well and are paying off. Um, before I open up to questions, I wanted to just uh, remark on, on one thing and get your thoughts on this. Um, given, given that you're retiring from American Express right. and given that uh, Melody Hobson was here earlier and right. really gave a powerful conversation about uh, diversity uh, in, in the corporate world and, and across, the, across the world more broadly, um, this, uh, this I thought was a very depressing fact. When you were named CEO of American Express in 2001, you were only the third African American to run a Fortune 500 company. When you step down later, in a couple months from now, right. there will only be three African Americans right. in the same position. What has happened? And you spend a lot of time talking to companies now about diversity. I think at the end of the day, uh, one of the biggest issues for our society is diversity and inclusion. And the point is that I think we tend to overcomplicate the issue, uh, despite the depressing numbers that we see out there. The reality is there are incredibly qualified people uh, who can move into those positions, but you've got to put them into the pipeline. And what's critical is, in fact, to identify recruit, develop, and push people forward. So the fact that we're in this situation, I think is a real problem and is embarrassing for corporate America because we should have far more representation of all different groups, genders that are at the top. And that's something that companies need to be very focused on. We're going to open it up a bunch of questions, but you, you now make a point of that's, that's an investment criteria for you. Well, behaviors are going to have to change, and this is one thing we're, going to, we're asking companies. Uh, you have to force behaviors, and at BlackRock, we are forcing behaviors. 54% uh, of the incoming class are women. We, we added four more points in terms of diverse uh, employment this year. And it, if it, you know, what we are doing internally is if you don't achieve these levels of impact, it, your compensation could be impacted, okay? We're doing the same thing. And so it's just, it, you have to force behaviors. And if you don't force behaviors, whether it's gender or race or just any way you want to say the composition of your team, you're going to be impacted. And that's not just not recruiting. It is development, as Ken said. And ultimately... It's still going to take time, but I am just as much shocked as Ken is that we have not seen more opportunities, and we're going to have to force change. Let's uh, open it up to questions. Uh, Brent is in the middle here. Let's uh, get him a microphone uh, if we could. Brent Montgomery. Gentlemen, um, thank you, Andrew. In this current climate, uh, how how is, are your businesses changing uh, as far as HR and PR? And how, and how does your focus change as you know, one statement or, or, or one offhanded comment at a dinner party can, can change the course mm -hmm. of a company? You know, at the end of the day, from a uh, PR standpoint, my view, uh, and it's one of the things that I said to my successor uh, several months ago, is understand your under the microscope and assume there is a microphone with you at all times, 24 by 7. Uh, at the end of the day, though, what I think is important if you're going to be an authentic leader 
is be clear about what your values and beliefs are. And don't be afraid to express where you stand on an issue. And so what I think happens is you have some people who just make stupid, foolish statements that are not relevant at all. But there are other situations where, in fact, you need to take a position. Uh, and I think that's increasingly important, uh, that corporations have created an ecosystem. And one of the points that I make is our society allows corporations to exist. We're not entitled to exist. And so we have a responsibility to society. And I think our leaders, in fact, have a responsibility to be leaders. And so that scrutiny, I accept 100%. Okay, let's sneak in one final question. I've gone way over time, and I apologize. Um, oh, I, I see Steve Lippin. Jeff, we'll get you next time. Um, Larry and, and, and Ken, I, I think we agree. H how do you force change, though? I mean, Larry, BlackRock has, has really been the forefront of the ESG movement within, within corporate governance and a real leader. And yet, change is so slow. So what is, uh, and, and Ken as well, what, what, how do you force change when it is so incremental and so gradual? Um, how do you do something more radical? Have you thought about that? Has the board of American Express thought about more radical things we could do to enhance diversity and inclusion? Well, I, I could speak about BlackRock's board, but it doesn't come from the board. It comes from the, it, it really has to come from the leadership of the firms. And if the leaderships of the firms are not doing the changes, hopefully the board forces that change. And if not, it's going to be the shareholders. Okay, hopefully the shareholders don't have to do it in our vote. But I, in my last corporate letter, I spoke about it. Um, I would just say something to tie in what you said in the first question related to PR and HR. I hope it doesn't come to just, I hope it's never part of HR because it has to be imbued in the culture of a firm. It has to be talked about, it has to be shown. Behaviors across the entire firm in every region have to be similar. And every citizen of the firm has to understand what is acceptable behaviors and what are unacceptable behaviors. And it's the same <laughs> linkage about what are the acceptable, responsible behaviors related to building your teams. I look at it for us is, our, if we are not a mirror of our, who our clients are, we're going to fail. I, and so here's a big issue. 55% of all wallets are managed by women. I actually believe we are going to have to have 55% of our citizens <coughs> to, be, to be female because we're going to be a mirror of our clients. If, if, if the African-American population of America is 16.2, I expect one day we to be closer to 16.2, and on and on and on. Because if we fail in delivering that reflection, a reflection that has that high quality, consistent delivery, so we have to de develop people, not just putting people in places, but developing and getting that done. If we could deliver that, we will continue to drive growth for our shareholders. I would just simply say, because I know we're running out of time, we've been on this journey for 25 years. And what's critical to Larry's point, it's got to come from management, but the board also has to be very focused on it. And that means that you just don't have diverse slates but you say, what are the outcomes? Because at the end of the day, if we put together a plan and someone's not achieving their results, we don't say, oh, you put together a great plan. I'm not worried about it. So accountability is critical. And I think what's important is in both of our compensation systems, people feel it in the wallet. The other thing that I look at is representation. I want to see progress. And then I also want to see selective moves that are made because when you put people in selectively who are strong, all of a sudden, the representation starts to change in the company. But you can't do it unless, in fact, people see there are consequences. Mm -hmm. And the other point that I make is it's good for business, but frankly, I want to be in an environment where people are fully accepted and engaged. 
And as I told a group of our employees yesterday, when someone says to me, when I look at you, Ken, I don't see color, I say, then you got a problem. Because I'm very <laughs> proud about who I am. So don't deny that I am African American. Accept me for who I am, engage with me, but don't deny my heritage. That's important. Because we don't have enough honest discussions about race in this country. And to do that in the corporate workplace, I think we have an incredible opportunity to demonstrate to the broader society the progress that can be made. Here, here. Ken Chenault, Larry Fink, thank you for the thank conversation. You.